She was born into showbiz royalty, the daughter of famed Italian director Roberto Rossellini and Academy Award winning actress Ingrid Bergman. With brains, beauty, and talent, she's carved out a career to be envied. As a model, she was the face of Lang. As an actress, she starred in films as diverse as Blue Velvet and Death Becomes Her. And as a producer, she gained internet superstardom by writing, co-directing, and starring in a series of shorts for the Sundance channel called Green Porno, where she acts out the mating habits of insects and wildlife. Hello, I'm Ernie Manoos. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with Emmy and Golden Globe nominated actress Isabella Rossellini. Has your concept or idea of beauty changed over the years? I don't have an understanding of beauty. I mean, you know, yesterday I presented a film that I did about my father, because my father is 100 years old. And when I'm asked, why did you feel the need to make a film about your father? It's because my parents are always remembered, or because of my work as model. I'm always asked these questions about the glamour, the red carpet, the wonderful clothes. and. Of course, there was some talk about it, but it wasn't the principal thing that we've talked about in my family. Um, my family was successful, and so some of it came with it. But, uh, you know, my mom looked at movies m m as if art, not really as a showcase of her beauty or her showing her clothes. Or, you know, she it really, she was really breaking with the tradition, so much so that she was then thrown out of Hollywood, where she didn't come back for many years. Right. And I always loved fashion, and so it was delightful to be, uh, I was delighted to be a model for so long. But to me, the great interest in fashion was photography, for example. So, and I think photographers were, are given a showcase in fashion to show their art. So they know that they have to photograph you beautifully, because uh, because the f the context is fashion and or beauty or cosmetic, but really the research is in composition and color and all that. So I I don't really know uh, specifically what is beauty. I never really think about it. You know, yeah. you don't think about that. You think uh, to have you know if you wear a beautiful clothes, how to make it flow in like a dancer. You know, in a in a certain way to make a shape. Uh, in that frame that it is a square or a triangle or is horizontal or vertical. So the truth is that I don't spend much time thinking about beauty. You know, there is the saying, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And that is also true, you know, what uh, it is important that what is beautiful for you remains beautiful mm -hmm. and, uh, and that you assert it. And actually, uh, I think that the definition of style is when somebody does recognize uh, has an Im has a reaction to something and shows their reaction, yeah. you know. And then we have a way to learn, you know. I have uh, I have seen, uh, for example, films that first time I've seen it, I thought they were terribly boring. But then a wonderful reviewer would explain it to me, and then I would look again at the film. Oh, and now it looked beautiful. Yeah. Uh, or you know, you can also think of uh, George O'Keefe or. Maria Callas, they weren't particularly beautiful women uh, according to the rules that they were at the time, but they had such wonderful styles yeah. that they became beautiful. So beauty is also not only in the eye of the beholder, but it's an expression. Well, let me take you all the way back. Yes. Do you remember a point when you realized how well known your parents were? Was there ever a moment when mm. you realized, hey, wait, they're famous? Yeah. Not really, not really. First of all, I grew up in Europe, so uh, in, in Europe there is less that feeling that filmmakers are in America, they are like the American royalties, right. uh, but in Europe we have the royalties and so <laughs> filmmaker is considered very popular, but is a job. So there was less of that emphasis. And then it did take me uh, quite a while, you know, I didn't understand uh, how famous they were until I think I was an adult. Still today, I'm surprised that people uh, 
uh, remember my mother, Ingrid Bergman, or my dad, uh, and to remember them with such fondness. Yeah. But it does, it's hard to imagine, and I would imagine that, uh, you know, the children of Angelina Jolie, that they don't realize how famous for there is mom. As Ingrid Bergman, for me, was really mom, principally. Yeah. You, you tell a story of being at a, I guess it was maybe an antique store, and you're wandering around, and you kept seeing this woman off to the side. Can you tell yeah. the story? Well, I went to an antique store, and uh, I saw a woman, and uh, I thought, oh, you know, I thought she reminds me of my mom. And, uh, but she was, seemed to be a little bit like uh, she didn't want to be disturbed. So I kept on, you know, as we were walking around, if I seen her, I would walk away not to disturb her. And then I thought, she's very elegant, but a little snobbish, huh? I better not deal with her. And then I realized that I saw myself, it was myself in the mirror, because in this <laughs> antique store it was very full of things and they had mirror. So occasionally I would capture my image and I didn't recognize myself uh, because I'd aged. <laughs> and you remember yourself younger in your head. And uh, I was delighted to find myself elegant, not so delighted, I found it myself a little bit snobbish. <laughs> And I even said I look like my mom, which is something I always heard all my life, and always said, no, I don't really look like my mom. My mom and I, when we looked at each other, we never felt that we looked so much alike. Now, uh, uh, but when I was little, my God, all the time people say, you're exactly like your mom, you look exactly like your mom. You look exactly <laughs> like your mom. <laughs> There's another thing you, you talk about is that when people talk about the older films of your mother, that that woman on screen isn't a woman you really knew. Well, my mother, uh, you know, became, in, in, when she was in her 20s, uh, uh, a huge star in Hollywood doing films like Casablanca or Notorious. She worked a lot with Alfred Hitchcock. And um, I was born after that period. As I have said, my mom was very interested in art and film as art. So when she saw, after the war, in 1949, she saw films that my father did in Italy. And Italy was the enemy country. It was a fascist country that had allied himself with the war with Hitler. And, um, and then came my father who showed films about how the civilian lived the war and lived the fact they were enemies. And these films were incredibly touching, incredibly moving. And in a way they served also to reconcile uh, the world with Italy and the fascist. Um, when my mother saw this film, loved them. This film had only an incredible new style. It, they looked like documentaries. They didn't look at all like film. They didn't have the beautiful lighting and the better than life quality of the Hollywood film. They looked like documentary, but obviously they were not documentary. You saw people shot mm -hmm. and dead, uh, dying on screen. So it was obviously uh, fictional. Um, this film were very incredibly influential to the modern cinema that happened after the war. And my mother, once saw this film, wrote to my father wanting to make films with him. When they met, they fell in love. And my mother became pregnant with him without obtaining a divorce from her first husband. My mother right. was a Swede. So there was all sorts of protest in America, and my mother was not allowed back. The basic idea was how do we allow foreigner to come to our country, ra take advantage of our country, raise to be stars, and then give such bad examples to our youth. And the, even the American Senate took uh, a stand against my mother, wanting to create laws that would control who could become a star and who, uh, you know, a little bit like uh, the check -up, the checks that you do on. Uh, when somebody will be a CEO or a politician, you make sure that you're in your past right. there isn't anything uh, that it is dark. So hopefully in the future you're not uh, going to. And so there was the attempt to uh, control also art and who should be known or not known. So, but meanwhile, my mom has a Swede, uh, was not allowed back. When never came back. I mean, came back years later, but worked very little in Hollywood. Ever Growing since. up then in that household, what was your understanding or view of America? Uh, uh, the devil. Really? <laughs> yes. No, my mom loved it, but my dad, no. My dad felt <laughs> very, uh, uh, very betrayed, very frightened uh, about uh, uh, this incredible backlash against my family. Uh, so was it rebellion when you came? 
No, it wasn't. By then, my father had reconciled completely, and actually thanks to uh, uh, Dominique and Jean de Menil, who uh, took my father, who have in Houston are so important in the arts, and they were patrons of the arts. And actually, Jean and Dominique de Menil took my father under their wings, and it was one of the artists that they fostered. My father's intent with cinema, it was to use cinema to, um, because he said to me, if I have to describe an elephant, I would say something very big, gray, with a long nose, and each one would have a different idea of what this elephant is. And if you have to read about it, you, take, you have to learn how to read and write, and everything is very imprecise. But when you have photos or film, you immediately, in one second, have a, a lot of information, a lot of precise idea. So my father gave, attributed to cinema, the ability to defeat ignorance and therefore misery. And in that utopistic, enthusiastic uh, uh, commitment to society, it felt uh, you know, a good year in Dominique de Menil and Jean de Menil, who were looking for artists that was also socially committed. And actually, my father came to Houston and opened the media center at Rice University. And meanwhile, he was trying to create, uh, under the patronage of the de Menil, a way to make films about science. Not a documentary, mm -hmm. but some a new film where you can, uh, because they were very much against the idea that art and science is two worlds that never meet. And they felt that was an artificial separation that was damaging, and the two had to be reconciled. So my father did reconcile to America, but not with Hollywood, but the America of... Uh, of the great patron and the America of the great universities. And I don't mean to jump away from where we're talking no. right now, but I can't help but see the similarities then with green porno. Yes. When you talk <laughs> about yeah. what your father wanted to do with science and art and image. Well, I didn't think about it when I did uh, my short films. My short films were uh, commissioned to me by the Sundance Channel, that you know is the great Robert Redford, who is the head of it. And uh, Redford, throughout his life, is obviously an enormous Hollywood star, but he always felt that Hollywood and Hollywood studio was one expression of cinema, mm -hmm. but that cinema has to have uh, other voices too, and not just a voice of the studio. So he was incredibly influential uh, to, to the independent film, wh where also became so important in America, creating the, the film festival and financing film. And to him, it, this is what it is about this country, which is diversity and having everybody speak up. So you can't have just the voices of this ma ma gigantic film that cost a lot of money, and they are marvelous, but you have to have other voices too. And Redford commissioned, because it felt that the internet offered an opportunity for these other voices also to be heard, now for short film for everybody. And so he commissioned me and other artists to create a series especially for the internet. And I've, I have personally always been very interested in animal behavior. And what Redford said, you know, in my series, if there is any reference to the environment, I will be more inclined to finance it because he's a very big environmentalist. I thought, oh, I'm going to make <laughs> a series about animals. But what is it about animals that everybody will be interested in? Sex. Because I know everybody's interested in sex. So I made several episodes, two minutes each, about how animal mate. And the films are not documentary. They start with me saying, if I were a fly, and then I transform myself with an uh, incredible costume that uh, uh, Andy Byers and Rick Ma uh, uh, Gilbert helped me create. I transform myself in a fly, and then I show how they mate. And I do that for 28 <laughs> animals. <laughs> are there more of them still to come, or are we done with that series? No, you're just about a new one coming out called S Seduce Me. We wanted to eliminate the word porno because we were solicited to have sponsors. You know, one of the things that we don't know how it's going to work in the internet is how is the internet and short films or like YouTube or what you see in YouTube can be monetized, can create a business. For the moment, we have an incredible tool of distribution, but we don't have any ways yet to make the artist who create this film get the money back. Finance, uh, yeah. To finance. And this is one of the great uh, um, 
mystery as of how the internet is it going to just be a recycling bin of something that you do on television but because they also steal audience to television television is becoming poorer and that's the same right. problem with the music the same sorry with the publishing business so we are in a period of transition where we don't know exactly how to reorganize so so there is the incredible ability to reach a lot of people but we don't have we can't sell tickets you can't uh, sell copies of books you can't pay royalty so how do artists right. can get oh, not only artists but everybody who works in the industry of cinema get some of the money back so they can perpetuate making film how do you envision property ownership of art I I do think that yeah, and, you know I I do think that it has somewhat to exist I mean I understand uh, uh, that uh, I mean I was very touched today going to the Demenil to see this fantastic collection that it is for free uh, so that everybody can walk in while I live in New York and entering in a museum in New York is twenty thirty dollars and if you bring your children it's you know easily a hundred dollars that go so uh, for sure I, I have this great admiration but we have to find it doesn't have to be copyright whatever it is but I do think that artists should earn money that it isn't a hobby mm -hmm. uh, you know that artists should learn because if Picasso had to make a living as an accountant or as a lawyer he wouldn't have been Picasso he wouldn't have time it takes time to become an artist uh, it takes time and concentration so we have to create I know it's strange because uh, we have to create a system where they can earn money from right. their art. Let me take you back again a little bit. I'm curious, what made you decide to go into modeling? I was offered to become a model and by a photographer called Bruce Weber, a wonderful fashion photographer and a photographer, also a filmmaker. And Bruce was delightful, and I started to work with him, and one thing led to the other. You know, I worked with him, and then I got the cover of Vogue, and then Richard Avedon wanted to meet me. And I didn't think I was going to be a model, but obviously when Richard Avedon or Bruce Weber call you and they say, <laughs> we'd like to photograph you, you say, well, absolutely, that would be a fantastic opportunity. And I didn't know that it was going to turn into a 20-year a career. Then. And I mean no disrespect when I say this. It was later in life for you to start as a model. Well, I started when I was about 28, which is an unusual age. I looked much younger. Nobody asked me how old I was. So when I finally, somebody did say, how old are you? And I said, you know, by then 32. <gasps> People said, well, you know. I, but uh, that tells you how, how much we have uh, stereotypes about age, you know, and how ageism uh, um, can influence how people are seen. Yeah. Um, they'd forgotten to ask me, and I was anyway the daughter of, so th I was always the daughter of, so I must have been young. I couldn't have been in my 30s. <laughs> yeah. Does that ever get tiresome, being the no, daughter I, of? No, when, when, when I was young, a little bit. Not now. Not now. My parents, unfortunately, died 30 years ago, and I'm delighted to, uh, to be their daughter, and I'm delighted that they are still remembered, so I'm, I'm pleased. Now. Is it, was it hard to see your image larger than life walking in New York and there you are on billboards, walk into a department uh, store and you're on well, every it wasn't, counter? It wasn't difficult, it was delightful, but not in, in the exhibitionistic way, you know, not in like, ah, oh, you know, you, you do a job and you hope to um, really fulfill it, so you do a photo and you, when you do the photo in the studio, you see it maybe in a Polaroid that it is like this, and you have to imagine that that image has to be so striking that when you walk in the, in the airport running to your gate, it still catches you so that you can, because, and so when you finally see uh, the photo where it was meant to be, and if it is striking, if it is arresting, if it does communicate the message that you are there to communicate, you feel like you've done a good job. So how then does that set you up to go into acting? Are you performing in these images? Are Absolutely, you yeah. Are you keenly aware of your audience? Yes. Uh, you, 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 modeling, it's almost like being a silent movie star. You know, you don't have to have a dialogue or, uh, but you do have to show emotion. There is, you know, the great Diana Vreeland who was considered a sort of a, uh, philosopher or, <laughs> you know, uh, high priest of fashion said there is no beauty without emotion. It, you know, it's nothing if you are the perfect nose and blue eyes and blonde, but you stay like this in front of the camera, it, that's, that doesn't work. It's the emotion that the camera has to capture and it's the emotion that people react to. 
So in that sense, it's also like acting, where you emote in front of the camera. Yeah. But you also have to learn a dialogue, and you have to pace your emotions so that you can tell a story. So it's a little bit more complex, but definitely uh, there is a lot of uh, things in common between modeling and acting. Was it an easy transition for you? Um, it, yes and no. I, some difficulties in the language. I think uh, English is not my first language, and so it, I always act in English or French. Italian is my first language, but now I haven't spoken in so long. So I do think that visual, just visual art, it's better for me. I can nuance my voice the same way that Laurence Olivier nuanced it because it isn't my language, so I don't feel it deep down. You know, sometimes I deliver lines, and I remember some director saying, well, why do you say that with an interrogation mark? I said, I don't say that. <laughs> I say it with certitude. He said, no, I, I hear, and I think it was just the Italian, you know, song yeah. that made it, deformed it into an interrogation mark instead of a, an affirmation. So I work, uh, 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 because, but I do have an accent, and so I, I think ultimately, uh, that I felt more comfortable as a, as a model than as an actress. Was it White Nights where they didn't think you could do the Russian accent and you were like, wait, I'll, I'll get this? Well, yes, they often hired me to play Russian, German, and all this. I, you know, I, you, you, you're glad to get a job, but I mean, it's a little bit generic, you know, to say, if you are a for you, it's American and the foreigners, you know, right. you also have to live through that stereotype. So you accept it because it's a job, and you're trying to work with a voice coach to to change it a little bit so that it doesn't come across terribly Italian, but a little bit German, a little bit Russian. But um, yeah, it, I find it a little bit strange that I was given those roles. I mean, thank you, but uh, <laughs> it is strange, you know. <laughs> Talking about strange, everyone would be after me if I didn't ask about Blue Velvet. Sure. What was your concept of it when it was first presented to you? What did you think of think, this film? Um, I I, uh, I read the script and I thought the script was wonderfully wonderful, origin, original. The character were wonderful. I immediately understood. It was very clear to me that David was a David Lynch was a major talent and a major artist. Um, I asked David if we could rehearse the scene with Kyle MacLachlan, the actor that played the lead and most of the scenes with me. Because uh, I just wanted to make sure that I understood the character because I play a very disturbed woman and I wanted to make sure that that's why, uh, that's the way David in envisioned it. And, uh, and then he offered me the part. David explained to me um, that one of the scene, maybe the most controversial in Blue Velvet is when I come out walking in the street completely naked and exposed. And David explained to me that when he was a child, he had gone back to s home, and he had seen a woman walking naked in the street, and he didn't giggle or he didn't feel, oh, sexy. He burst into tears. He understood that there was something very alarming behind this unusual sight. And that is what he wanted to convey in this film. And. Uh, the image that, when David was talking to me, that came to mind to me was a photo by a Vietnam photographer called Nick, Nick Art of that uh, the girl walking in the street after a uh, Nepal bomb burned uh, her village. And actually, what I thought were clothes uh, hanging from her were actually her skin. Mm -hmm. She had, um, And that gesture seemed so helpless. And that's the gesture that inspired that I have adopted for the character of Dorothy Valance in the film. But frontal nudity is not accepted in film, strange enough, you know, I mean, nudity and titillating, but also covered, I mean, also complicated uh, to deal with some, with what is acceptable and not acceptable, you know. So when the film came out, it was a huge scandal, which I didn't expect, you know, I didn't expect uh, uh, that if I walked uh, with a bush, <laughs> but it suggested nudity, but ne you needed that impact uh, yeah. because you needed that shock and you needed to recreate the fear that David felt when he was a little boy. And I understand your conversation about it from an artist's point of view, but it must have been shocking, surprising, the first time you were sitting in the theater and you saw it up on screen. 
Well, you know, you don't you don't make a film and then all of a sudden you see it uh, in a theater with the audience. You, you go to the editing right. room, you're seeing being edited. And also it was an independent film. It was very small. It was meant to be for an art house. So Blue Velvet has become hugely successful, very, very controversial. And then little by little, it got the reputation of being a wonderful uh, uh, film. Uh, well, we didn't expect that success, you know, and also to be exposed to that kind of uh, press or that kind of, you know, it was meant to be um, more of an art house film. And so maybe reviewers or people would understand it better. But instead, when he hit them, you know, it became a pop culture. Then, you know, all sorts of theory came out. Is it porn or is not porn? Or is Isabella yeah. doing this to destroy her mother, Ingrid Bergman, <laughs> is to rebel against her or to destroy her image as a an a model? You know, there were all these uh, theory, but it was just uh, an artistic film, and I understood it from the beginning and certainly didn't expect uh, that awful reactions. It was pretty tough. Well, that might have gotten some shocking reactions, but so much of your work has been so well received. Even that, yes. thank you so much thank for taking so the time much. to talk with us. Thank you. Isabella Rossellini. Thank you.